Good morning, Word Serve. It's good to see everybody here. Man, I hate it when people get together and talk and socialize and have fellowship and all that stuff. Isn't that terrible? I mean, you would think you were walking into a house and a family or something. That, that's just dreadful. So, hey, welcome to Word Serve this morning. Uh, we, we have some great news. Uh, this is the start of the Advent season. Advent is a time of preparation. And what are we preparing for? We're preparing for the coming of Christ again, the second time around. So this is a wonderful opportunity to prepare our hearts and minds. Uh, as we begin this morning, though, I want to start with a word of thank you, because this is one of my uh, blind spots or weaknesses. Usually I'm on to the next thing, and I don't pause and celebrate the last thing. But this morning, we have reason to celebrate the last thing. Anybody know what the last thing was? What's the last big thing WordSurf did? Operation Christmas Child. What did we say our goal was this year? We were going to break last year's record. Did we do it? Yes, yes we did. Anybody want to guess how many total boxes that came through WordServe? Ooh. Whoa. Ooh. Eight. <laughs> 1,044 boxes came through WordServe. That is a new record for us. Yes, that is worth a hand. And that is due to your efforts. Thank you for taking the time to pick up a box, go out and shop. That means 1,044 kids are going to get some good news and some good presents this Christmas. It's not about the box. It's not about the things. That's what grabs their attention. What grabs their heart is the word that's shared in that process. So thank you, WordServe, for contributing to 1,044 pieces of good news going across the globe. When those boxes arrive, we'll actually get a code. We'll try to track where they landed, and we'll let you know what 1,044 children you affected. But today, we are here, we are preparing, we are celebrating this, the coming of Christ. We're preparing ourselves. And sometimes it's hard to remember that. Sometimes in the midst of everything that's going on, we can be drugged down. Our vision can be taken off the goal. But I want to encourage us this morning with these words from the psalm. It says, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. Wait for the Lord. As we wait this morning, will you stand and sing with us? Well, I can officially say Merry Christmas. For some of you, you've had to wait this long for your Christmas music, but it's now okay to listen to it, and it's here. For others of you, you are dreading the fact that people can now play Christmas music, and you can't make fun of them for it, because it is indeed Christmas. But because of that wonderful thing that we celebrate, can we just join, because the most beautiful, perfect gift was given to us, walked among us, served in our place, paid for our sins, and now we stand here this morning and we celebrate that joy. Amen? Oh, come on. It's better than the Phillies winning the World Series that they didn't win. Come on, that joy. Come on, amen? Amen. All right. So we sing... Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Every heart, let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sings, and heaven and nature sings, and heaven and heaven. Heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world. Come on, we sing. Joy to the world. The Savior. Let all the songs employ. God fills and fills. God fills and plays. Sounding joy. Let's put our hands together this morning. Come on. Joy. Unspeakable joy. An overflowing well. No tongue can tell. And joy. 
praise this morning. You give, you give. Come on. Because you give and take away. Give and take away. My heart will choose to say. Oh, blessed be your name. Oh, you give and take away. Give and take away. church we sing all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow he washed 
celebrate the birth of our Savior, which is the promise of that payment that we rejoice in this morning. So we praise the name of our Lord this morning. We lift a cry of celebration for He is worthy, for He is perfect, and He has gone in our place so that we can stand this morning and sing this. And oh, praise the one who paid my debt. And raise his life up from the dead. Come on, oh, praise the one who made my dead. And raise his life oh, praise, up oh, from praise. the dead. Oh, praise, oh, praise. No, praise the one who made my dead. And raise his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who made my dead. And raise his life up from the dead. Jesus be It's quality over quantity. It's a lot less on the stage than you're used to seeing, but hey, between vacation and sickness, you know, what you see is what you get. That's kind of what I love about WordServe, right? It's awesome. So my name is Pastor Bill. I want to welcome you to WordServe Church this morning. I want to also make you feel at home to get up and get coffee or whatever you need. Um, just make yourself at home. Treat this as like your own home and this is your family, because it is. I want to encourage you to fill out a connection card this morning. We're going to put a QR code on the screen, and you can take a picture of that with your phone, and it will take you to that connection card that you can fill out. Let us know that you're here. It's also got a block in there for a prayer request. So if you have a prayer request, we have a team of people that would love to pray for you. So if you cannot get it off of the screen, you can get it over here at the Welcome Center, where Jim, my hand model, is standing. Thank you, Vanna. Um, <clears throat> And you can snap it right there. Let us know that you're here. Let us know if you have any prayer requests. We would love to pray for you on all of those things. In terms of giving is the other thing that we typically talk about, which we also have a QR code for. Uh, you can give in a multiple uh, multitude of ways to WordServe. We always talk about time, talent, and treasure. So I've already thanked you for the time and, and treasure that you've given through Operation Christmas Child, and I will continue to thank you for the many things that you do on behalf of God here in Fulcher and, and literally around the world as we saw with Operation Christmas Child. I also uh, need to say thank you for all those who contributed and volunteered hours and uh, I don't know how many miles Jeff has on his truck now, but uh, he took a load after load, which was, did we get any pictures of that packing? Because that was kind of impressive. I mean, I've never seen that many boxes going to pickup truck. It was, did they all make it down there? Okay, good, yeah. <laughs> As if I would doubt, right? <laughs> I 
it's, it's an awesome thing. And like I said, we'll try to track where they go and let you know where they ended up. So thank you for all your, your time and talent there. Uh, ministry does take money, so if you would like to give, we have a myriad of ways to do that as well. We have a financial team that promises to be good stewards of your money. So we will publish a quarterly report of the finances. If at any time you have questions about where the money goes, please feel free to ask. And if we can't say it's being used for God's kingdom, then we need to change our ways. That's how you keep us accountable. I already received my word served jet, so I need to think of a new grand, big, hairy goal. Um, for What's that? A tank. Ooh, or an RV. How about an RV with a gun? <laughs> yeah, for those of you that didn't know uh, or haven't seen, I got the inflatable jet uh, that says word serve on the side. It was way cool. So I feel fulfilled. I, what else can you want in life, right? All right. So uh, thank you uh, for everything that you're doing. Thank you for what you give. Uh, many of the gifts that we give uh, are used here locally and around the world, as you saw with Christmas Child. Uh, but we're also going to do a Faithful Kids packing party. Now, this year, everything is a little bit weird because the first Sunday is January 1st. Now, I don't know. Uh, I mean, Wordser people are diehard. I know you'll be here at 8.55, an hour and five minutes in advance. You can get warmed up for service. But some people may choose to sleep in after the previous evening's festivities. So... Here's what we're proposing. We, we usually do communion and Faithful Kids Packing Party on the first Sunday of the month. We're going to push it back to January 8th. That's not an excuse to stay home. <laughs> I just want to say that up front. But to ensure that we get maximum participation, we're, we're going to talk about maybe doing that. So I will keep you posted on that. The other things coming up for Christmas that are a, a bit unusual, uh, we will have a Christmas Eve service at 6 p.m. right here. And that's a candlelight service. It's a great tradition of word serve. It's one of my favorite things in the whole wide world to see the candles light up the place uh, and hopefully not each other. Uh, we'll have glow sticks for the kids, so not to worry. And that's at 6 p.m. right here. The other thing that we'll have on Christmas Day, which is a Sunday, we will have a service. Uh, Bill, we just did this big thing Christmas Eve, right? And Sunday is Christmas Day, and we will worship. But what we're going to do is we're going to combine services with First Fulcher, and it's going to be held in their sanctuary, and we will have one service at 11 o'clock. So if you have early morning Christmas family routines, you can still knock those out and still come and join a combined service in the sanctuary at 11, and I will be there, as will some of them, and hopefully some of you. So enjoy. We'll, we'll be putting that out through social media and everything else, but I just wanted to give you a heads up because I want you to be thinking about and praying about who are those people that you're going to invite to Christmas Eve? Those people that may not have a regular church home, that may need a little bit more hope and joy in this season. And uh, this is going to be a message on Christmas Eve I'm kind of excited about uh, because it talks about uh, how we look at God and maybe how God looks at us. And it is, is a message of great hope, as Christmas should be. So be thinking about who you're going to invite on Christmas Eve at 6 p.m. Where? Right here. Exactly. Will there be fire? Yes. Will it be controlled? I pray to God. Yes. <laughs> All right. So we are a praying church, and it is time to pray. Will you join me, please? God, we thank you for this season of preparation, but sometimes it's hard to wait. It's hard to put off our timeline and our schedule and our desires. And God, I pray that you would help us usher into a season of preparation where we prepare our hearts for you where we prepare our ears to hear your voice guiding us, where we put aside anything that stands in the way so that when it comes time to run the race, we can run without any hindrance. And God, there's a lot that hinders us. It's all the stuff that we brought in this morning because we're human. It's all the things, the thoughts that cloud our minds and clamor for our attention. God, I pray by your spirit that you would quiet all of that this morning so we can hear you and you alone. And I pray in the hearing that we would be transformed. God, thank you for all that you do, all that you have done, all that you will do. In Jesus' name, amen. With the start of Advent, it should be no surprise that we're starting a new sermon series. Yay, it's called Advent. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Pretty deep. Watching and waiting because this is a season of preparation uh, just as the first Christmas when they were watching and waiting for a Messiah, we also are doing the same. Now, we have the benefit of historical experience because it's happened once. But guess what? It's going to happen again. 
And we don't know when that is. So every Advent is a reminder to prepare our hearts for the second coming of our King. And that's what we'll be doing. Here's how we're going to do it. Uh, today's uh, sermon is called Wait For It. The next one is called Simeon Sees. I see it's Simon Says, but Simeon Sees. It'll make sense then, all right? Uh, it's Never Too Late, Blessed. That's a question mark. And on Christmas Eve, you've made a mistake. And that's us talking to God. If you want to hear more about that, you got to come what time on Christmas Eve? And where? And who are you going to bring? <laughs> Sweet. Man, you guys are good. I'll tell you what. All right, so wait for it. How many people are fans of waiting? <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> yeah, waiting is hard. Waiting is equated to passivity. And in our culture, especially North American culture, that is not a good thing. You want to be out there. You want to be aggressive. You want to be a go-getter. Nobody ever said, man, is he ever the best waiter ever? What? No, that's not in our vocabulary unless you're talking about someone who gives you service at the food table, right? We, we don't like to wait. But I'm telling you this, this morning, there are, are some wonderful things to be gathered by waiting, especially as a Jesus follower. And I want to start, start by telling you a story. A couple of decades ago when we would go to visit uh, Rana's mom, uh, she lived in Hamilton, Illinois, which uh, if you're not familiar, it's a town of about this big. And it's right on the Mississippi River. And my favorite part was on the drive, you had to go across from Iowa to Illinois, across a bridge, across the Mississippi River. And what was cool about that, it's always cool to see a big river, right? But here's what was cool about that, because there were some huge trees, and every once in a while, you would catch sight of a bald eagle. How many people have ever seen a bald eagle for real, in, up close and in person? Yeah. Isn't it impressive? I mean, I'd seen them on videos and pictures and things before, but when you get a little bit closer, those things are huge. I mean, I was like, hey, don't, kids, don't get out of the car, right? <laughs> They'd probably carry them off. They are amazing. And as I watched them soar, uh, literally soar and, and just do all these aerobatics and, and graceful flight, and it just looked like they were effortless. And I, I, I began to think, wow, that is, they are so majestic. They are so powerful and yet so effortless how do they do that and then my mind immediately went to oh, god's creation is so amazing look at this this power and this majesty and, and it's effortless and that's kind of how i want to be as a jesus follower i'm just not sure how to do that and so this morning we're going to take a look at uh, some lessons from an eagle uh, uh, and waiting to make us more powerful now i bet you've never put those two together waiting and power, or waiting and strength. But we're going to put them together this morning because that's the way it should be. Now, those effortless eagles make it look so easy. I want to take this into our realm now. I want to talk about human beings. Have you ever met an effortless human being that's a Jesus follower? They, they, they might look like, uh, well, that, that's not them. <laughs> that's, that's an eagle. <laughs> they might look like this. This is, a, oh, everything just works out for them. They have the happy family. They're, everything is just perfect. They follow God. They serve everywhere. They never say a bad word. They never speed. I don't think that's necessarily in the Bible, but you go with me. So the, everything just is perfect, and it's effortless, and I hate them. Do you? <laughs> Come on, be honest. <laughs> We're all about authenticity. Uh, this is a wonderful picture, and this is what everybody desires, but there's this little thing called, I don't know, reality that sets in. And this is more like what Thanksgiving looks like, right? <laughs> everybody had everybody's throat. So this, this reality is what drains us. This is, this is the difference between what we wish was and what is. And sometimes that difference just sucks the life out of you, doesn't it? And the same thing happens with our faith. What we think should be as a Jesus follower doesn't match what really is, because what really is feels more like a struggle. It looks more like this. Uh, this was a picture of the last word service lead team meeting. I, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, our lead team is wonderful. <laughs> but it could be. No. <laughs> So sometimes that effort and that struggle just wear us down, and we begin to wonder, is this worth it? Is this following Jesus worth it? I thought this was going to be so different. I'm here to tell you that it is worth it. And, and maybe we just a few small tweaks will make all the difference in the world. 
So this reality is real, no doubt about it. But this reality is nothing new because people have been struggling to follow God throughout history. In fact, today's passage comes from the prophet Isaiah. And I want to give you a little bit of a, a setting towards this before we read it. We're going to be in Isaiah chapter 40. It'll be a familiar verse when we get there, but let me tell you the setting of this. The prophet Isaiah is talking to the southern kingdom, which has been exiled. Now, if you're not familiar with how this goes, in this case, the Babylonians have run through and decimated the southern kingdom, the last remaining kingdom. The high and mighties, uh, the, the important people in, in Judea, were carted off to Babylon to be re-educated. It was oppressive. The Babylonians were not nice people. Uh, they would make the, the current Russian-Ukraine war look like the Cub Scouts were coming to town. I mean, these people were awful, and they did terrible things. And so they are under captivity of the Babylonians, and Isaiah says, hey, you know how it's bad? It's about to get worse because the Persians are about to overthrow the Babylonians. So you're in a period of double exile where everything that you've known is gone. You have no say in what you do. You're under the rule of people who are not nice and some people that you don't know that are coming that are about to make it like a double exile because they're going to conquer the ones who are ruling you now and you don't know what's coming down the pipe. Cyrus and the Persians are about to roll through town. There's going to be a new sheriff. That doesn't sound like a period of great hope and expectation, does it? I mean, if you look at our country today and you talk, oh, there's polarization, there's hatred, there's all these things, man, that pales in comparison to what we got going on here today. And yet, Isaiah says these words out of chapter 40, verse 31. I'm getting a tone from the computer. I've never gotten that before. Did somebody lock on me with a missile? No. Okay. I'm good. I have to, I have to keep moving. <laughs> chaff, flare, chaff, flare. No. All right. So here's, uh, here is what Isaiah says to the southern kingdom who's in double exile, about to be exiled again. He said, even youths will grow tired and weary, and young men will stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary, and they will walk and not be faint. These are the words of God for the people of God, and for these words we are grateful. Isaiah is either really in touch with God or really a lunatic. There, there's no middle ground here. He's, he knows what's coming. He knows they're already in exile. He knows they're about to be run over again. And he say, hey, good news. You're going to renew your strength. If you wait on the Lord, just wait for it. I can see Isaiah saying that. That's the Bill version. Wait for it. Nobody wants to wait for it. Waiting is not, like I said, the, the first choice when you're living under oppression. Wouldn't be my first choice either, to be perfectly honest with you. But I want you to look at a couple of things here. <clears throat> As we look at the text, even youth grow tired and weary. How many people have seen the boundless energy that are children? You know what I mean? They have two speeds. All go or all stop. There is no in between. You can sit down. I, I uh, sometimes help out uh, and I teach jujitsu classes uh, when, when they're away. And these kids will come in and they will run like mad people. Uh, and, and it's time to start and you do a full hour of jujitsu, which if you don't know what that is, it's exhausting. I mean, it, it, you, adults will lay there in a puddle of sweat afterwards and not move for like 10 minutes just to regather strength to get home, right? These kids will do an hour of this. And you're like, Oh, man, they're going to sleep good tonight. And then you shake hands, and the final dismissal is, and guess what? <sighs> it's, it's mayhem. Like, where does this energy come from? If I could bottle that, I would be a millionaire, and I would have a real word surf jet. <laughs> I don't know where that energy comes from, but this is, what, this is why this is so important. Even those kids who have boundless energy will grow tired and weary. Now, I know Isaiah is trying to give hope, but he's setting it as it is. This is for real. Even the best of human energy will fail. That's his message, if you, if you tear back the layers. Even the best of what we have, the most energetic, the most youthful, the most vibrant, will fail. Well, that's not a very hopeful message, Bill. Well, not if you stop there, but let's not stop there, all right? Young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. 
There is a boundless source of energy. And it is outside of us. And this is good news. Because it doesn't depend on Bill. It doesn't depend on you. It depends on the one who has boundless energy. How do I know this? As I always say, if you want to know more, read the circle around the Bible verse, right? Read a little bit before, a little bit after, a little bit more before, a little bit after, a little more before. Look at what's right before that. And starting in verse, um, let's start in verse 27. <laughs> it says, why do you complain, Jacob? <laughs> why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Man, this is good news. This is great news. He gives power. He increases the strength. And how does he do this? Well, I'll, I'll tell you how he does it in Christians in a minute, but we've got to get through eagles to get there. Here's the magic about an eagle, as I see it. Eagles are strong. They're majestic. They're powerful. But most of the strength doesn't come from them. Have you thought about this before? I mean, imagine an eagle in flight, and, and you're swooping down. Oh, that's fierce. Now, imagine that same eagle walking on the ground. Meh. It's just not inspiring, right? I don't know how eagles walk, but, you know, that's, it's certainly less glamorous than flight. You know, if an eagle came up and attacked me on the ground, I'd be like, eh, you know, no big deal. If I'm in the air, now this is a big deal. So here's the point that I'm making. When that eagle is in the air, the strength is the eagle using the air. Does that make sense? It is absolutely fascinating to think about because this eagle can stay aloft for hours not even flapping a wing. Is that not amazing? This eagle can travel up to 200 miles an hour by changing the shape of the wing as it goes through the air. This eagle can ride air currents and travel miles on almost no effort. See, the eagle's strength isn't just the eagle. It's how the eagle works with the air. Now, if you were tuned in to us a few weeks ago, we talked about this word spirit, uh, pneuma, or in, in the Hebrew, ruach. It means breath, but it also means wind. And it's the same word that is used to describe the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Remember what that story was like when the disciples were gathered and this mighty rush of what came through? Mighty rush of wind, the Spirit. So it seems to me that there's some way that we can work with the Spirit that will make us far more powerful than we are by ourselves. How do we do that? Well, let's get some lessons from an eagle. Here's the first lesson from an eagle. Perspective. Eagles have incredible eyesight. There's a reason we use phrases like eagle eye. Eagles can see prey from miles away. They know if they're in the right spot. Eagles can probably sense, hey, there's air currents right now. This is a good time to fly. Or there is nothing going on. This is a good time to watch the game. I'll just wait and see if y'all are paying attention. <laughs> Eagles watch games? Yeah, Philly does. <laughs> I did that for Jimmy, especially. Right? So, so eagles have incredible eyesight. Now, we can see things too, but here's the advantage that Christians have. We have incredible insight. By the power of the Spirit, God can help us look past the surface. God can help us to see that family that looked perfect but really isn't and is hurting. God can help us to see that family that's struggling. Maybe it's the marriage. Maybe it's parenting. God can help us with that insight to see where the real needs of our community are and make an impact there. But we have to see it through his eyes. So that's the first way that we can start to look through Jesus' eyes and understand where the needs are in our community. The, the Colossians says it this way. Paul says this, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. There's a whole world out there that's going to try to drag our eyes down. Uh, no offense to anybody who's in advertising, but advertising is a, is a great, uh, does a great job of this, right? You've got to have this thing to be happy. You've got to own this. You've got to wear this. You've got to live in this. And those are earthly things, and that is the perspective of the world. But if you want insight, we've got to look above that. 
And when we do that, we will start to see things. So here's a question I'm going to be asking you, Lord, sir, because it's not up to me. It's up to us. As we approach 2023, we're going to be looking at some visioning. Where do we go forward as a church? And here's my number one question. What needs are you seeing? What needs is the Holy Spirit revealing to you right here in our community so that we can begin to position ourselves to best serve this local community and the world beyond? That kind of vision only comes from us yielding to the Holy Spirit. And that's not eyesight. That's insight. So that's the first lesson from an eagle. It's about perspective. The second lesson from an eagle is placement. You will not find eagles where there is no prey and no wind. (laughs) Duh. Because if they're there and there's no prey and there's no wind, they're going to die. They don't stay there. So they place themselves where they can do the mission, which is to fly and get food and feed their young ones. So how does this translate then to Christians? Well, I think sometimes God places us where there is not prey, uh, well, maybe (laughs) P-R-A-Y, where where we pray, but where there is a mission for us. And what is our mission, Lord, sir? Thank you, sir. That will be an extra donut for Jim. Make disciples. This is what we do. So God puts us in places where we can make disciples of Jesus Christ. Now, we don't often sense that or see that. And the reason I say that is as I talk to many people, not just you, but as I talk to many people and I say, how do you share the good news? And after a hmm and a ha and a well and a uh, I find out we don't really do a good job of sharing the good news. Sometimes it's because we don't know what to say. Sometimes it's because it makes us feel uncomfortable. But people, this is our mission. This is where we've been placed. And we have the best mission in the world, the greatest story ever told, to make disciples of Jesus Christ. And so we have to figure out how to get over that, and we're going to do that in the new year. That's part of the visioning process. But for now, just recognize that we have been placed in this place And while you may look at a perfect family, well, what looks like a perfect family, go, oh, they already have a church home. They don't need anything. You sure? Really? I'm not, uh, look, (laughs) for the record and on camera, I am not looking to poach other churches. But here's the thing that I also observe from where we have been planted. Look at this graph. This is growth in Fort Bend County, and I'm sorry that it's an eye chart. I can't even read it. But. Here we are at uh, 900,000 about now, projected to grow to 1.8 million. This is Fort Bend County. This is probably the fastest growing county in the United States. And God has placed WordServe here to be a light to the world, to make disciples. I don't know exactly when 1.8 happens, but it's coming. So wouldn't it be wise of us to prepare so that when it happens, we're ready to take action on that mission? Why would we wait until all these people are here and go, oh, gosh, we should reach out to them. What should we do? No, (laughs) let's start thinking now. As we prepare, as we wait, there it is, wait for it. As we wait, let's prepare so that when these people come, we are ready for them. We have something to offer them. We have good news of Jesus Christ. We have life-transforming good news. Let's prepare now so that when it happens, we can be effective. We can soar and not struggle. That's the second lesson from an eagle uh, placement. Here's the third lesson. It's posture. It's always about posture. The thing that fascinates me, and and granted, okay, I'm an air guy. I'm fascinated by aerodynamics and all that stuff. But the the eagle's wings, as you look at this, it absolutely fascinates me. Did you know that those wingspans can be up to eight feet long? That is amazing. Did you know that those eight-foot wings weigh less than two pounds? Also amazing. Did you know that pound for pound, an eagle's wing is stronger than an aircraft, a modern aircraft wing? Is that not fascinating? And here's where I know God's involved. If you look at these, uh, uh, my pointer doesn't work on a TV, but if you look at the leading edge of the wing, you see a lot of little tiny feathers stuck together, and, and the, the bone on the front of the eagle is, is pretty broad, and then it tapers back. That's so that air, air, um, airflow is accelerated over that part of the wing. And for those of you who are aerodynamic fans, what happens to an accelerated airflow? Lower pressure, which causes lift. The wind's doing the work, not the eagle. 
And that's how it happens, by those tightly packed little feathers on the front. If you look at the back of the wing, you see the broad feathers. There's a very clear demarcation. How many people have flown on an airline by the, by the wing? What happens when they come in to land? The flaps come down, right? Because you've got to slow down. I mean, if you're an eagle and you're aiming for that tree, you probably don't want to hit it at 200 miles an hour. I'm just guessing, you know? It would be like you going to the mall and pulling into a parking spot at 100 miles an hour. Right? Oh, wait, I've seen some of you drive. Maybe that's, maybe that's not a good example. <laughs> but you've got to be able to slow down. You've got to be able to control and, and, and do all these wonderful things to get yourself safe. Those are just like flaps. And I have a feeling that God made it on the eagle before we thought of it. And then the, the wings, winglets on the outside there. How many people have seen uh, some of the more modern airlines that had this little thing sticking out of the wing that looks like this? You know what that's for? Dude, you've been doing some homework. Wingtip vortices. Basically, as the, as the, the air rolls off, it creates those little swirls, right? Well, that creates drag. That holds the airplane back. So when you do this, it stops them from creating drag. This makes it more efficient. And guess who, start, who thought of it first? God. God's already got this. So these lessons from an eagle are powerful, and that posture that the eagle has is outstretched. Now think about this. As that wind is going over those eagle's wings and producing lift, the frame of the eagle is actually being supported by the wind. It doesn't have to do anything. And as that wind passes over the wing and it produces lift, he just soars around all day. With those incredible eagle eyes going, ooh, that's a tasty morsel. That absolutely fascinates me. I can't look at this and not say, what an awesome God we have. Who thinks of all this stuff? Right? And then the second thing I say is, why is it so hard for us? Shouldn't it be easy for us? Because as we operate in the spirit, in the wind, we should be able to take advantage of that wind. We are built because God built us to be supported by that wind, to soar like eagles, and yet we walk like turkeys. That was a Thanksgiving joke. <laughs> All right, they don't get any better than that. So what is our posture then? Here's typically our posture. You know, this is the eagle's posture, right? Soaring wings, eight feet long. Here's our posture, though. We tend to be a little more tight-fisted because we're trying to control what we have. We don't want to let go. We, sometimes it might be called greed. Sometimes it might be called survivalism, whatever you want to call it. I'm not the most generous person on earth. I will admit that to you. And sometimes I try to hold on to not just money. Sometimes I try to hold on to control. Any other control freaks in the room? Great. Nice. Let's control freaks anonymous. That'll be another group in the new year. Yeah, sometimes we hold on so tightly. We hold on so tightly because we don't want to lose control. We hold on tightly to our kids. We hold on tightly to our money. We hold on tightly to anything that we can hold on to because it gives us some semblance of power and control. But I'm telling you, that actually makes us weaker because the more that we draw in, the less wingspan we have to offer the Holy Spirit to work. And I'm talking about our souls right now and not our hands. So our posture tends to be this, but there's another posture that if we're going to be Jesus followers, why don't we adopt the posture of Jesus? Jesus is into wingspan, and it looks like this. Eagle's wings, eight feet long. And Jesus' arms, long enough to encompass the world. And Jesus served his purpose, used the Spirit, was uplifted by the Spirit in this posture. And it says right here that he says, this is Jesus' quote, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. So if I were to ask Jesus right now, Jesus, what posture should I have in my spirit? What would he say? This, the one that helps me deny myself, that look to neighbor with that insight that he's given me, the one that helps me come alongside someone who's hurting. I don't have to say anything, just a ministry of presence. The one that makes me genuinely uh, generous, the one that gives freely, the one that does not just for me but for all. That's the posture I think Jesus would call us to. And so what my encouragement is in this Advent season as we prepare, word serve, is to prepare to soar. Think about this. Pray 
for that insight that we talked about. Serve where you're placed. Find a way to give back to what God has given you already. That might be money, that might be time, that might be talent, that might be anything. But I wouldn't hold any of it back because it's all been given to us. And we'll find great ways to use that. And then finally, assume the posture. Whatever we have to do, if you've ever seen the Eagles on their downtime, they don't actually watch games. Sorry to disappoint you, Jimmy. What they do, though, is they'll preen the feathers, that they're removing anything that would cause drag or turbulence in that flow in their lives. And in the Christian world, we call that sin. We remove that. Actually, he paid it all. That's why we owe it all to him. So take this time, word serve, as we prepare to remove any obstacle that you have, anything that would cause you turbulence, anything that would ruin your flight, and prepare ourselves for this thing that is coming. I don't want us, word serve, to miss out on the opportunity because I know that the Spirit will come. And I know there will be another mighty rush of wind right here in Fulcher. And Bill, that sounds egotistical. And it would be if it was Bill saying it. But it's not me saying it. It's actually the prophet Joel that is echoed by Peter in Acts 2 as the Holy Spirit came the first time. Listen to what he says. Oh, Lord. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. That's all y'all or yous if you're from Philadelphia, right? (laughs) Sorry. I got to let go of the Philly thing, really. I will will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. And what will we tell them, Lord, sir? We will tell them the good news of Jesus Christ, but only if we're ready to soar. My question is, Lord, sir, will you prepare now? So that when that spirit comes in full force, we are ready to soar. I don't want you to miss out on the ride. I don't want you to miss out on the journey. And I want to go with you. So use this season of watching and waiting to prepare to soar. Will you pray with me, please? Yeah, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that guides us. We thank you for Jesus' sacrifice that made it possible for us to access that. And God, it's hard for us to wait on you, but help us to understand that in the waiting, we're waiting for the Holy Spirit to arrive. And it's not a passive waiting, God. Help us to be active in our waiting. Help us to take away all the obstacles that stand between us. Help us to take away anything that would prevent that Holy Spirit from working through us. Help us to lay down our posture of tight-fistedness and open up to a posture of spreading out our arms just like you would call us to do. Help us to deny ourselves, to take up that cross daily, not as a punishment, but as an opportunity to soar. Because God, if we do this of our own accord, we will burn out. We will run out of the end of us. Even the youth that have all the energy will grow weary. God, in you, you give strength to the weak. You give power to the powerless. You help us to soar. God, help us to soar for your glory and for your honor. And in the name of your son, Jesus, amen. We stand together this morning. As we worship, as we sing this morning, the imagery of that baby born, it is not the victory that they were expecting. It's not the promise that they were given that they would be a conqueror and a king who would take back the world from where they were. But he came to make a way. And that baby that's born in that moment becomes the greatest path to freedom, the greatest path to hope, the only path to hope and the path to our salvation. So we sing this morning about that beautiful, precious child. 
and we give praise for that gift. And as Bill had said so many times, God's design was there from the beginning. So even though it doesn't look like we think it should look, he has made a way. A way in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet hair. The stars in the sky look down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the Come on, we sing. You are the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. That little baby was. Come on. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Because you are. You are the way maker. Miracle worker, promise come on, come on. Light in the darkness, my God. Come on, we sing, we sing. Oh, and you are, you are are the way maker. We trust you, Lord. We trust your ways, Lord. Light in the darkness, we trust the path that you made this morning. Our God is a way maker, a miracle worker, and the only thing he asks of us is to prepare because he is coming. Go in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and prepare to soar, Lord, serve, because it is coming. Will we be ready? Yes, we will, by Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in his name and do his work, the mission of making disciples. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming.